So hello, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Philip Boulder and I'm pleased to be chairing today's session of the webinar series which Monk has been putting on with the Centre for European Legal Moncton Faculty of Law webinar series on EU relations law. This is the fourth edition and it's titled UK External Trade Relations. And to talk about that topic, we have four eminent experts in the field who are ideally placed to enlighten us on the field of trade law. As we know, the UK EU deal still hangs in the balance 29 days before the end of the transitional period. Uh, however, deal or no deal, the UK uh, needs to find ways of replicating or replacing existing trade deals to which a party in the EU. This is what the government calls Global Britain. Uh, and we also have to the implications. Our speakers will be Professor Catherine Barnard, Professor of European Union Labour Law at the University of Cambridge. We'll look into a crystal ball to speak on the EU-UK future trade relationship. Next, Jerry Hassan, you see at Moncton Chambers, will speculate about approving and implementing a new relationship into domestic law. At third, Alexander Hall, a barrister and legal advisor to the House of Lords International Agreements Committee, whose expert topic is parliamentary scrutiny of trade agreements. And finally, Dr. Brenda McGurk, a barrister at Moncton Chambers, Affiliate lecturer at Cambridge, who will speak on external relations, Ireland and Northern Ireland. Each of them will have uh, about 10 to 20 minutes on the topic of their choice. And you, the audience, put questions via the uh, question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. And then I will try to answer them at the end. So, starting with Professor Barnard, please, Catherine. Thank you very much indeed um, for those kind words. In fact, um, given that uh, the, uh, there is no deal on the table at the moment, uh, the organizers actually asked me to change the focus of what I was going to talk about and talk about um, how any um, ratification process might work um, given the extraordinarily short time uh, that's um, available. So, um, what I'm going to do is actually address two questions. One, um, the first one is, if I can just get the screen to move across, um, can we have a bit more time, please? And secondly, um, assuming there is magic and a deal occurs, uh, what the process is um, to get us over the line by the 31st of December. Just before I go on, can I just check you can see the slides? Yes. You can see the slides. Thank you. Um, so um, first question, um, can we have a bit more time to get the negotiations over the wire? Now you'll recall that Article 132 made provision for asking for an extension. Uh, the UK government did not take that up given their manifesto commitment. And I think it's quite striking that in the Commission put in its Q&A that the only way to get an extension is um, the Article 132 process. There is no other legal basis for extending the transition beyond 2020. Now, lawyers wouldn't be lawyers if they didn't think creative ways around the problem. So what might the creative ways be? Some people say, well, look, we can use Article 50 because Article 50 um, uh, under international law is the legal basis for withdrawal agreement. And thus, um, it could be the legal basis for asking for an extension. EU lawyers, on the other hand, take the view that Article 50 was probably turned off on the 31st of January and so cannot be used in effective legal basis. What about a magnificent EU heads of state and government international agreement, which essentially says, well, of course, we can get EU law to carry on applying um, to the UK as it does during the transition period for a period of time um, post the 1st of January. The problem with that, I think, is that um, it's a question of competence that to try and extend the application of EU law in all of the areas which currently applies would require an EU agreement, not an international agreement. So I'm not sure that's going to work. 
So more realistically is that um, you have a bolt-on implementation period, um, which is bolted onto the front of any deal. And that implementation period is a genuine implementation period, not what Theresa May's government called an implementation period, um, to um, essentially transition to the new state. The problem is all of that is premised on there being an agreement. So what about seeing if the Joint Committee can do some of the heavy lifting? The Joint Committee, you'll remember, is the committee set up under the withdrawal agreement to sort out all sorts of bumps in the road um, uh, which have arisen in respect to the withdrawal agreement. But the problem is Article 164.5D, which is the most relevant provision, excludes any amendment to the withdrawal agreement about matters con contained in part four, which is about transition. Final bid in desperation to try and find a way around the problem. Some people say, what about using Article 352 of the treaty? And remember, that's the catch-all legal basis um, provision to attain one of the objectives of the treaty. And the trouble is withdrawal is not an objective of the treaty. It's a residual legal base. So the bottom line is, it seems to me, it's going to be very difficult to come up with an alternative which is legally watertight. Of course, necessity is the mother of invention. And it may be that if um, a few more weeks are required, some sort of magic solution is dreamt up by the brilliant minds um, in UK government in Brussels, but we shall wait to see. My second question I want to have a look at briefly is ratification, provisional application. And I'm going to look at this from the EU perspective. My colleagues um, will look at it from the UK perspective. Now, if there is a deal, it will have to have a legal basis in the treaty. It seems most likely to be um, Article 217. Certainly, the Commission has said publicly in the same Q&A that 217 um, is currently chosen or would be chosen because it's the widest legal basis and also would be the one that's most suitable for an overarching governance framework. Of course, that presupposes that there is an agreement on said overarching governance framework, which is still one of the sticking points. Um, whether you call it an association agreement, as was the case with Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, or whether you call it something like uh, CETA, Comprehensive um, uh, Trade Agreement, or whether you call it an FTA, the label isn't determinative, but the fact is, as you can see, different um, legal bases are used for different types of agreement. But as far as we are aware, the Commission is talking about 217 for this agreement. In either case, it's subject to the procedure in Article 218. Now, the big problem is competence. And the reason why it's such a big problem is because the question of competence tells us whether it will be an EU only agreement or it will be a mixed agreement. Now, I know the font here is rather small, but I hope you can see that um, the treaty has done some of the heavy lifting and identifies those areas of exclusive competence for the um, EU, but also areas of shared competence and indeed all other areas of member state competence. Why am I pushing on this? If it's an area of exclusive competence of the EU, then it can be an EU only agreement with the Council voting on it, possibly by, um, or probably by unanimity if some of the areas are areas which require unanimity. But if on the other hand, it um, touches upon any of those issues in the third three pillars, the pillars where there's an orange line underneath, then it will be a mixed agreement. And if it's a mixed agreement, that requires not just um, agreement of the Council and the Parliament, but it's also got to be ratified in accordance um, with uh, the national ratification processes, which nobody seems to know the precise answer to this question, but it's somewhere between 34 and 38 national and regional parliaments will have to have their say. Now, I keep hearing rumours that the EU thinks even though it might be a mixed agreement, um, they will try to say that it requires only EU ratification. And this was the case in EU Japan, even though, even though EU Japan was, it did involve areas of shared competence, because the member states agreed to allow the EU to ratify it on its own. 
there is a wonderful irony here that the UK has been always at the forefront of arguing that all agreements are mixed agreements so that the member states um, can keep tabs on the Commission and make sure that the member states can ratify. And you can see that in the case of the Canadian CETA. But I do hear rumours that um, they are, the, the Commission has got agreement, the Council got agreement, that it could be um, ratified only by the EU and treated as an EU-only agreement. <laughs> then finally, as to process, um, this is uh, the key stages in the process. Um, the first two, um, the first bullet point is already underway and the negotiations are taking place and then hopefully there will be agreement on some sort of text. Then there are three more stages, or at least that's what Article 218 tells us. Stay, the first stage is um, a decision on signing, so signature of the agreement. Then there should be um, consent, and then there should be um, agreement on um, adoption um, and ratification. Now, the interesting thing is that Article 218.5 not only makes provision for signature of the agreement, but it also makes agreement for its provisional application. The council can um, agree that the um, treaty be subject to provisional application pending ratification by all of those national and regional parliaments if that is indeed required. Now, as you can see, the signing and the adoption are different phases but in fact in practice and certainly I think since um, EU Korea they have often been wrapped up into one document that the there's a decision on signing a decision on provisional application and a decision on adoption and all of this is dependent on the European Parliament's consent so um, that brings us back to the question of provisional application of the agreement. Provisional application, just to remind you, that's where um, you have parts of the agreement coming into play even before it's been ratified. Um, the Vienna Convention allows it. Um, the uh, Article 218.5 of the TFEU allows it. And it is the Council that um, allows this to occur on a proposal from the negotiator, so from the commission from Michel Barnier. Um, but as I've said, practice has been that the European Parliament consents before uh, there's any provisional application, which brings us to, is there time for the European Parliament to have its say? And that brings us to the much rumoured um, extraordinary session on the 28th of December. With provisional application of the agreement, um, what you see is it only applies in areas where the EU has competence, but as that quote from Chamon indicates, in fact, it's somewhat broader than that. All of this presupposes that there's a deal, that there is a proposal for provisional application, that the European Parliament is in favour, and if it's a mixed agreement, um, uh, it will give time or buy time before the while the member states ratify and remember ratification can take about five years what if a member state fails to ratify then provisional application stops and i will stop there that's a whistle stop tour of what might happen next at the eu level thank you very much Kath. Thank you very much for that, Catherine. And uh, next we have um, Jerry Fasena, who's going to be talking uh, about um, uh, you tell us, Jerry, approving and implementing the new relationship in domestic law. Yes. Yes. Well, um, several months ago, when when um, uh, these talks were planned, it seemed a reasonable bet that by the second of December we might have some idea both of the substance of any new trading relationship with the EU and uh, the shape that that might take in terms of its implementation in domestic law. But anyway, here we are, and um, even uh, giving a 10-minute talk on the domestic implementation of the new relationship is currently quite a challenging brief. Now, I know that Alex is going to um, say something about parliamentary scrutiny and the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act. All I'll say on that point is that at least, uh, at least for this agreement, if there is one, it clearly won't be possible in practice to meet the default 21 sitting date procedure under that act. 
Um, although, as we already know from the 2020 Withdrawal Act, there are various ways uh, around that, including primary legislation that simply dispenses with the 2010 Act requirements. Uh, give, given where things stand or don't stand, all we can really do at the moment is look at the little that we do know uh, about the government's plans for domestic implementation of any agreement and some of the arrangements that would have to be made in domestic law to give effect to an agreement if there is one in the coming days. So first of all, what, what are the options? And there are a limited number of ways, uh, of course, in which the government can change the law or introduce into domestic law the necessary provisions to give effect to any deal. Um, in practice, I think in this case, it's pretty clear that implementation of any deal will involve some combination of those options. And if you, if you want to explore them in, option in, in further detail, I should say there's a, there's a useful summary um, in a paper published by the Institute for Government on the 18th of November, which you can find on their website, which goes through a number of options for UK ratification. But as I see it, there are broadly three. Um, the, the first, which is in a sense the simplest, but most controversial and I think unlikely to be used, would be to give the agreement direct effect in, in domestic law. Now, one can see that that might be quick, quick and dirty, but it raises all sorts of difficulties. And it seems to me it's very unlikely. Uh, first of all, uh, aside from the EU treaties themselves and certain parts of the withdrawal agreement, it's more or less unheard of for international agreements to be given direct effect in domestic law in the United Kingdom. Um, direct implementation is certainly not what the UK uh, seems to be uh, considering in relation to any other free trade agreements and particularly for any EU agreement one can see why it would be likely to be extremely controversial with at least some sections of Parliament uh, and in any event even if you could uh, do it for some aspects uh, simply giving di direct effect to the agreement in domestic law wouldn't, wouldn't be sufficient because there are obviously going to be all sorts of technical regulatory requirements uh, detailed arrangements that, that would have to be set out anyway in other parts of domestic law. So direct effect in the way that we've seen, for example, the citizens' rights and the withdrawal agreement seems to me uh, not very likely. But the second option is that you pass a bill uh, which implements the relevant clauses of the agreement. So clause by clause, section by section. Um, a new piece of primary legislation implementing the various bits and pieces of the agreement on trade and, and security uh, and state aid, for example. Now, that would obviously um, be the most comprehensive and sensible way of doing it, because you could ensure that the entire agreement is properly implemented. You can tailor the act appropriately and you don't have to rely on a, a range of existing or, or new secondary legislation partners. There are, however, very obvious difficulties with timing. I mean, frankly, there are obvious difficulties with timing, what, whatever form implementation might take. Um, but both given that you'd have to draft that legislation in a way that correctly reflects the details of the agreement and you'd need time for Parliament um, to consider and, and enact what would undoubtedly be a relatively complex um, piece of legislation. Uh, there, there, are, there are obvious problems there and at least from the government's point of view, at least in theory, you also have the danger of unwanted amendments um, to such a piece of legislation. And by way of comparison, the Institute for Government notes in, in its paper that the Canadian government had two years to draft the CETA implementation bill and the Parliament of Canada spent six months considering it. Now, obviously, nothing like that is going to be feasible here, uh, at least before the end of this year, uh, and not at all, unless there's some sort of implementation period or some other kind of extension or, or, or fudge um, of, of the sort that Catherine has mentioned. Now, the third option, um, aside from primary legislation, and which is quite likely to be used alongside any primary legislation, is obviously to use either existing secondary powers under existing enabling provisions, or to include some new wider enabling provisions, which, which allow statutory instruments to be made to give effect to the agreement. Now, there are some areas where uh, there are probably existing enabling provisions that could be used immediately and would allow some regulations to be made to give effect to certain aspects of the agreement. So consumer protection, food safety, uh, those kind of things. You can reduce tariffs already using existing statutory partners. Um, but there will still be other areas which might be capable of implementation using secondary legislation, but where there's no, uh, there aren't currently wide enough enabling provisions. 
So, for example, if the government had to set up a new state aid regulator um, or, or some new regulatory environment for state aid, seems to me that would need primary legislation. But uh, in any event, there's no there's no secondary legislation at the moment which would enable it to do so. So you would need at least a bill uh, which gives ministers the additional powers to implement uh, other aspects of, of the agreement. And that, of course, is the approach that the government has taken to much of the Brexit legislation to date. It's also clear from the trade bill, which is currently before Parliament, that it's an approach that the government intends to use in the future. So if you haven't looked at that, section two of the trade bill includes a time limited enabling power, which allows regulations to be made for the purpose of implementing an international trade agreement, provided it's one that's, that's with the party um, with whom the EU already has a trade agreement. So it's very likely, given the shape of that, that you can see something similar for aspects of any EU-UK agreement. That still obviously has difficulties. Um, I mean, leaving aside the amount of work for civil servants to identify uh, the relevant powers or gaps in the relevant powers uh, and draft the necessary uh, regulations, there is, of course, as, as many of us will know, um, considerable disquiet, particularly in the House of Lords, about the very extensive use of statutory instruments to change the law post-Brexit, um, e even where they've been subject to the affirmative resolution procedure. So there could well be resistance in Parliament to uh, a, an over-ambitious use of statutory instruments. But now, as to what we actually know, the truth is it's very little at this stage. So the government has not set out any proposals for a ratification process or a timetable or given any indication of whether there will be a parliamentary debate or, or a vote on any deal. Uh, in oral evidence given to the House of Lords EU Select Committee on the 7th of October, the Chief Negotiator, David, Ross, uh, David Frost, spoke briefly about what he referred to as the process at our end. And he confirmed that there is an assumption on the government's part, that's his word, that there will have to be primary legislation for at least some elements of an agreement as wide ranging as this. So uh, there's an indication there, and in any event, it's clear from what we do know about the agreement that at least some significant parts of it would have to be implemented uh, in domestic law by statute. And, and given the timing and where we are, there must be a real question mark over whether and how Parliament will be able to pass that legislation in time. So for any civil servants tuning in, you have my sympathy. I dare say many of you face uh, an even more miserable uh, Christmas period than most of us were, were already facing this year. Now, uh, aside from how they're going to implement any agreement, there are, of course, extensive changes and additions that have already been made uh, to the domestic legal framework. So quite a bit of the new uh, post-Brexit legal framework is already in place. So we already have the Fisheries Act 2020, the Agriculture Act 2020, the new Immigration Act, the, the Extradition Act, which at least in part replaces the European Arrest Warrant. And before Parliament, there's still at least half a dozen or more pretty significant pieces of primary legislation um, which, which plug some of the gaps and which will also, could potentially also be used um, to implement some aspects of the agreement and indeed include some fairly wide enabling provisions. So you've still got the Environment Bill, which is before Parliament, the Trade Bill, the now notorious Internal Market Bill, and apparently in the pipeline, uh, a, a finance bill, which, which may also include some uh, provisions which on their face uh, contemplate specific and limited uh, breaches of international law. So there is a huge amount of primary legislation already on the statute books to absorb and coming shortly. Uh, and uh, some of that is quite likely will be used to give effect to aspects of any agreement. Um, if there is an agreement, what this means is that it isn't just going to be a case of uh, spending Christmas reading the uh, reportedly 800 plus pages of the agreement and 1000 plus pages of the annexes or the draft agreement, but of all of us probably spending many months, indeed years, uh, getting our heads around a raft of new primary legislation that plugs the gaps left by withdrawal and, and builds these new external trading relationships into our domestic legal framework. So it's uh, largely speculation at this stage. We know very little. Um, maybe we can run the seminar again in January and, and see where we are. Thank you Thanks very much. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Tune in again for part two.
Um, now, third, we have uh, Alexander Hall, and um, you're going to tell us about parliamentary scrutiny of trade agreement. Thank you, Philip. Um, well, yes, I'm here today to talk about parliamentary treaty scrutiny, particularly scrutiny of trade agreements. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank uh, Kenneth and Jack for inviting me to be on the panel today and the Cambridge Law Faculty and Moncton Chambers for supporting uh, this event and helping get me uh, online. Um, briefly, uh, just to say a couple of words about me, I've worked as an employed barrister in Parliament since 2003. Uh, I was appointed legal advisor to the House of Lords European Union Committee in 2017 and legal advisor to the House of Lords International Agreements Committee in April this year. And uh, I was one of the lead officials responsible for uh, establishing the mechanisms for treaty scrutiny provisions uh, in the House of Lords last year. Uh, I should make clear at the outset I'm speaking in a personal capacity and not on behalf of either of the two committees. So the scrutiny of international agreements is very much a new task for Parliament and this may come as something of a surprise. And therefore, before I discuss Parliament's current scrutiny role, it might be helpful to provide some historical context. Uh, concerns were expressed about Parliament's scrutiny of international agreements as far back as the 19th century. In the introduction to his rarely seen second edition of the seminal work, The English Constitution, from 1872, Walter Barge had observed, treaties are quite as important as most laws, and to require the elaborate assent of representative assemblies to every word of the law, and not to consult them even as to the essence of the treaty, is prima facie ludicrous. He argued that it would be advantageous to require that, in some form, the assent of Parliament should be given to treaties, and that we should have a real discussion prior to the making of such treaties. Over a hundred years later, that's only re really beginning to happen now. Many of you will be familiar with the Ponsonby Rule of 1924, a convention which operated for almost a century. Ponsonby has three limbs, that a treaty will be laid before the House of Parliament for 21 sitting days, that important treaties will be submitted to the House for discussion, and thirdly, and often overlooked, that Parliament should also exercise supervision over agreements, commitments and undertakings by which the nation may be bound in certain circumstances and which may involve international obligations of a serious character, although no signed and sealed document may exist. Two further changes happened in recent years. First, the commitment by the government in 1996 in response to a private member's bill to produce explanatory memoranda alongside treaties. And this was the first time that the provisions of international agreements were described in plain English and allowed for uh, stakeholders to see the sorts of things that we were signing up to. The second was the passage of the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act 2010, which codified some aspects of the Ponsonby rule into statute. And that was the situation we found ourselves in in 2016 at the time of the Brexit vote. And it's important because it highlights the inherent limitations of Parliament's powers in respect of all international agreements, including trade agreements. In 2016, the only committee of Parliament which routinely conducted any scrutiny of international agreements was the House of Lords Secondary Legislation Committee. It only commenced this work in the 2014-15 session and by 2019, had not reported any agreements for the special attention of the House of Lords and had only provided short information paragraphs on uh, several other agreements. The limitations of the Crag Act have proved to be quite profound. The Crag Act does not provide Parliament with a specific treaty scrutiny role. It merely provides that the government may not ratify an agreement unless it's first laid a copy before Parliament and neither House has passed a resolution that it should not be ratified. Negotiating mandates do not have to be shared. There's no requirement for the government to notify Parliament before an agreement is signed. Any resolution against ratification passed in the House of Lords is merely advisory and can be ignored if the government provides reasons. The Commons can prevent the government from proceeding for another 21 sitting days and can pass further such resolutions indefinitely postponing ratification but there's no specific up-down vote on agreements. And if the government has a majority in the Commons, it's not clear whether they would have to find time for a vote at all. 
Moreover, the Crag Act provides that in undefined exceptional circumstances, the government may disapply Crag. While the UK's dualist system means that Parliament has to approve any domestic legislation implementing a new, new agreement, this occurs after an agreement has been signed and not all agreements require new legislation. During our membership of the European Union, the EU exercised primary competence over trade agreements. International trade agreements were scrutinized by the European Parliament, which provided democratic oversight. And Parliament's two European committees in the UK scrutinized ministers' activities in the Council. This combination meant that any lack of oversight was glossed over to some extent. However, when it became apparent that Britain was leaving the EU, the Financial Times reported that Britain might have to renegotiate hundreds of international agreements as the competence to negotiate and conclude international agreements in a range of policy areas was restored to the UK and the UK fell out of the original EU agreements. This included large scale trade deals with a number of significant economic powers, including Japan, South Korea, Canada and South Africa, as well as a vast swathe of smaller agreements and some significant multilateral agreements, such as the WTO Government Procurement Agreement. So what did we do? Well, in 2016, the House of Commons established the International Trade Committee, which scrutinizes the work of the Department for International Trade and also takes an interest in scrutinizing some of these arrangements. But much of the work in scrutinizing the government's trade continuity program was picked up by the House of Lords. In 2019, the House of Lords Procedure Committee tasked the European Union Committee with scrutinizing all Brexit related international agreements including the rollover agreements intended to replace the agreements previously concluded between the EU and third countries. In April 2020, the International Agreement Subcommittee was established as part of the EU Committee family. It's chaired by Lord Goldsmith QC, and after the end of the transition period, it's expected to be established as a full committee in its own right. As at the end of November 2020, the government announced that it had concluded 53 rollover agreements, accounting for 164 billion of UK bilateral trade. Each of these agreements has been scrutinized and reported on by the EU Committee or the International Agreements Committee, and a number have also been debated. The IAC has proved a busy committee. It's also launched four trade-focused inquiries into the UK's trade negotiations with the United States, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, respectively. A substantial report on the UK-Japan deal, which is now awaiting ratification, was published and it was debated last Thursday. While we're still in early days, Parliament's identified a number of common issues that have arisen in relation to these sorts of agreements. First, it will come as no surprise to the trade experts in the audience that a number of issues are commonly of interest to the committee. These include the provision of rules of origin, accumulation, tariffs, agricultural standards, geographical indications, state aid, dispute resolution and enforcement. None of these came as a shock. However, there have been other issues that are not entirely trade related and that have proved to cause difficulties in respect of both trade and non-trade agreements. These include consulting with the devolved governments and parliaments, impacts on the overseas territories, the procedures for amending agreements and whether such amendments would be subject to parliamentary scrutiny at all, the scrutiny of treaty-like documents, such as memoranda of understanding, that are not routinely deposited. However, the biggest issue is probably time, an issue addressed by the earlier speakers. To take one example as a case study, the recent Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement with Japan was more than a simple rollover agreement. It contained additional provisions on geographical indications, different rules on tariff rate quotas, and new commitments on e-commerce, for example. Both the IAC and the Commons International Trade Committee negotiated early sight of the draft agreement, but we still only received it 10 working days before the start of the statutory period under CRAG, and only on a confidential basis. That meant that stakeholders were unable to communicate with us on the document. That the committee was able to produce a comprehensive report to be debated within the 21 sitting day CRAG timetable had a lot to do with the fact that the text of the EU-Japan agreement was available and stakeholders were able to indicate in advance where issues might arise. <laughs>
The challenge going forward will be to scrutinize new potentially contentious agreements with countries such as the US, Australia and New Zealand, as well as the UK's potential accession to regional trade agreements, such as the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Some of these will be wholly new agreements with provisions on agriculture, data and tariffs, which may have profound domestic effects. It's hard to imagine that either stakeholders or parliament would have adequate time to examine such agreements on the current cracked timetable. This brings us back to the trade bill, which was mentioned by some of the earlier speakers. This may provide opportunities for Parliament to increase transparency and seek more time to scrutinise agreements. It reaches its final stages in the House of Lords next week. It will be for the politicians to decide what lessons they've drawn from our experiences of the last two years of treaty scrutiny. I'll leave things there and pick up any questions as they come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, our next speaker is Brendan McGurk. And Brendan is going to speak about Ireland and Northern Ireland. Brendan, please. Uh, thanks very much, Philip. Um, yes, today I want to look at a particular aspect of the relationship between the Northern Ireland Protocol and the UK Internal Market Bill, um, insofar as each relates to the question of what can be put on the market in Northern Ireland following the end of the implementation period. Now, to frame the discussion, uh, I will start with what's now familiar in relation to the protocol. In general terms, it's obviously designed to keep Northern Ireland within the European single market and the customs union in relation to the trade of goods, uh, both internally with other member states and externally with third countries. However, uh, there are, of course, uh, tensions within the protocol itself and tensions that arise from the need to provide for the fact uh, that Northern Ireland will not only remain within the EU single market and customs union for the purposes I've just described, uh, but will also continue to be treated as part of the UK customs and the UK internal market. Now, maintaining Northern Ireland within uh, the EU single market and customs union is the function of Article 5 of the protocol, uh, and thus it's Article 5 that creates the internal tension when set against Article 4 of the protocol, which guarantees that Northern Ireland is at the same time part of the UK customs union. And it is again Article 5 that creates the further tension when set against Article 6 of the protocol, which guarantees that Northern Ireland is at the same time part of the UK internal market. Now, the key provision for the purposes of my talk today is Article 5 4 of the protocol, which provides that the provisions of union law listed in Annex 2 to this protocol. Uh, shall also apply under the conditions set out in that annex to and in the United Kingdom in respect of Northern Ireland. Now, the list of regulations, directives and decisions set out in Annex 2 is very lengthy and included in that list are a large number of EU regulations and directives imposing uh, harmonised standards for a range of goods and products. Now, a, a good example and one I'm going to use throughout the talk to uh, frame the points I'm going to make the regulation 443 of 2009 which has since been repealed and replaced by Regulation 631 of 2019 on CO2 emissions from passenger cars. Now, the question is what happens uh, if and when the EU passes legislation that modifies any of the measures listed in Annex 2 to the protocol, and in particular, insofar as they raise the standards that were otherwise applicable on 31st of December 2020. For example, what if Regulation 2019-631 CO2 emissions is amended in 2022 to impose tougher emissions performance standards for new passenger cars than those that maintain it in the rest of the United Kingdom? Now, in that regard, one turns to the interpretative provisions of the withdrawal agreement to the protocol, respectively. In the withdrawal agreement, Article 6.1 provides that subject to certain exceptions, references uh, in the agreement to union law shall be understood as references to union law, including as amended or replaced, as applicable on the last day of the transition period. So evidently, Article 6.1 of the withdrawal agreement makes clear that references to union law will not include updating or superseding EU enactment passed after the end of the implementation period. Uh, the position, however, is necessarily different under the protocol, and the equivalent interpretative provision is Article 13.3, which provides that notwithstanding Article 6.1 of the withdrawal agreement, where the protocol makes reference to union, a Union Act, that reference shall be read as referring to the Union Act as amended or replaced. Now, indeed, the protocol could not sensibly work unless the enactments included in Annex 2 
including enactments that amend or replace those there listed, including such enactments passed after the uh, 31st December 2020. Now, to what extent can any UK statutory instrument imposing a product requirement uh, govern in Northern Ireland? And in particular, what happens if the EU amends an annex to regulation, as I say, to entire standards for such products, and which pursuant to Articles 5, 4 and 13, 3 of the protocol will apply in Northern Ireland, but which pursuant to Article 6, 1 of the withdrawal agreement will not similarly apply to GB. And therein lies the potential issue. Articles 5, 4 and 13, 3 of the protocol are liable to lead to regulatory divergence between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. Now, in my hypothetical car emissions example, a UK statutory instrument will, of course, permit cars that meet its standards to be put on the market throughout the United Kingdom. Uh, but an amended EU car emissions regulation imposing tougher standards applicable in Northern Ireland would appear to dictate that cars imported into or produced in Great Britain uh, may not be capable of being put on the market in, Nor in Northern Ireland. So the question is, to what extent... Uh, whether or to what extent, indeed, uh, that type of tension is either regulated or alleviated by the Internal Market Bill. Now, the bill sets out the what are known as the UK Internal Market Access Principles, um, which are first the mutual recognition principle for goods and second the non-discrimination principle. I have only time to deal with the former today. Now, section three of the bill defines the mutual recognition principle as the principle in which uh, goods which have been produced in uh, or imported into one part of the United Kingdom, known as the originating part, uh, and let's assume that the rest of GB is the originating part for these purposes, and B can be sold there without contravening any relevant requirements that would apply to that sale, should be able to be sold in any other part of the United Kingdom, uh, free from any relevant requirements that would otherwise apply to the sale. So take by way of example cars manufactured in Sunderland and can be put on the market and sold in Great Britain compatibly with all relevant requirements, including the domestic requirements pertaining to CO2 emissions. Now, the mutual recognition principle in the bill prima facie requires that those same cars can be sold in Northern Ireland, quote, free from any relevant requirements that would otherwise apply to the sale. Now, in my example, any enhanced CO2 standards applicable in Northern Ireland um, that will, we will assume, extend above and beyond those set out in the statutory instruments applicable to the rest of GB, will amount to relevant requirements that would otherwise apply to the sale of those cars in Northern Ireland. But if the mutual recognition principle does apply to cars manufactured in Sunderland, that would appear to require the hypothetical higher EU emission standards applicable in Northern Ireland to be disapplied. However, before reaching the conclusion that uh, the UK Internal Bill uh, permits indeed requires domestic law to disapply national standards uh, and not even in a specific and limited way, there are potentially two ways out of this conundrum. Uh, first, Section 12 one of the bill indicates that market access principles apply to Northern Ireland, albeit with modifications. And importantly, Sections 12 2 and 3 provide that the mutual recognition principle will apply to all Northern Irish qualifying goods but not goods produced in or imported into Northern Ireland that are not qualifying Northern Irish goods. Just two points on that. At first, the concept of qualifying Northern Irish, Irish goods is now defined in EU exit regulations to mean goods processed in Northern Ireland, where those goods do not compromise uh, comprise products which come into Northern Ireland subject to any customs supervision or control, i.e. genuine Northern Irish produced and processed goods and components. And secondly, the whole purpose behind uh, defining and delimiting a concept of qualifying Northern Irish goods arises from the imperative in Article 6 of the protocol to ensure ease of access of Northern Irish goods to the UK internal market, and in addition to avoid goods originating from the EU, um, uh, since failure to do so risks allowing Northern Ireland to be used as a backdoor for goods entering the UK market from the EU without the requisite checks. So genuine Northern Irish goods, as opposed to EU goods, uh, will benefit from the mutual recognition principle, but the cars imported into Northern Ireland for sale in Northern Ireland from the EU don't, and will fall outside the mutual recognition principle. But my principal concern today is not with the fact that the EU, with, uh, is not with EU imported cars uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, my concern is with the cars built in Sunderland, for example, and meeting X hypothesis only the lower domestic emissions standards 
and which will yet seek to avail of the mutual recognition principle in order to be capable of being put on the market in Northern Ireland, uh, even though that might, at first blush, mean non-compliance with higher EU emissions standards. Does that still therefore leave us with another clash between domestic and international law? Well, not necessarily. And the other way to potentially uh, reconcile the protocol and the mutual recognition principle in the bill is through section 11 of the bill, uh, which deals with exclusions from the market access principles on the grounds of public interest derogations. Now, it effectively states that the mutual recognition principle will be disapplied in the event that the requirement in question pursues a legitimate aim is proportionate and is not a disguised restriction on trade. And for the purposes of my continuing emissions example, a requirement will pursue a legitimate aim if it makes a contribution to the achievement of environmental standards and protection, which plainly any heightened EU emissions standards embodied in a future regulation will do. Now, a key question then will be whether those heightened EU requirements might be said to be proportionate. And in that regard, Section 11 provides the requirement will be considered disproportionate if the legitimate aim being uh, pursued in the destination part of the UK, which for our purposes is Northern Ireland, is already achieved to the same higher extent by requirements in the originating part of the UK, i.e. the rest of GB. That seems to me very difficult to say uh, in relation to product standards, that by definition lower regulatory standards that ex hypothesi may be applicable in Great Britain pursues the legitimate aim of reducing uh, CO2 emissions to the same extent as the EU regulation. Now, the argument may be much less obvious for standards that are not imposed numerically, but on the basis of more evaluative considerations where one can envisage uh, more argument that the EU standards applicable um, are said to be disproportionate such that the market recognition principle should apply and enable GB goods to be put on market in Northern Ireland. But Section 11 at least gives a route out of any inevitable or insoluble clash between Article 5.4 and Annex 2 Protocol on the one hand and the market recognition principle in the UK internal market on the other. But where does that leave us? Now, the consequence of the application of Section 11 of the bill is that, in my example, cars manufactured in Sutherland to the standards of an applicable UK establishment, but not to the hypothetically higher EU emission standards, but will mean that those cars cannot avail of the mutual recognition principle and will not be able to put, be put on the market in Northern Ireland insofar as they fail to meet the higher EU standards. Uh, in summary, assuming heightened EU standards imposed in Northern Ireland under Annex 2 to the protocol can avail of the public interest derogation on Section 11 of the bill, such that great British manufacturers and importers may not be able to place goods in the market in Northern Ireland. Uh, we might, unless the UK regulates in, a, in lockstep with the EU, or unless manufacturers end up manufacturing to the higher standards in any event, uh, be left with a somewhat bifurcated market for goods within the UK, as between Northern Ireland on one hand and Great Britain on the other. My guess, however, is that mutual regula regulatory tracking will occur, and that manufacturers will often opt to uh, level up in the manufacturing choices they make, which between them will by and large constitute the political and economic mitigating response uh, to the problem of an otherwise bifurcated market. So that's what I wanted to say on that particular set of tensions. Philip, I will pass back to you. Thank you very much, Brendan. And we now have some time for questions.